Hello everyone, this is Crypto Bitlaw back with another video for you. And today we're going to do a longer form analysis of a lawsuit that was recently filed wherein a Bored Ape Yacht Club NFT owner sued OpenSea over a bug or exploit that resulted in his Bored Ape NFT being compromised. And so he is suing OpenSea for damages and or the return of his Bored Ape. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through the entire complaint that was filed in federal court in Texas and then do a little bit of analysis on it and just kind of try to tie everything together so we get a, a full complete picture over what's going on with this particular lawsuit. But as always, before we continue, if you enjoy this content, please hit that like button and subscribe to our channel. Um, also, you can follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at CryptoBitLaw and... Please let us know what you think in the comments down below. Um, let us know any types of other content or topics you'd like us to cover because we want to hear from you guys. We want to touch on what you guys want us to cover. So with that said, let's dive right on in. All right, so first things first, this is the docket for this particular case. As we can see here, here's the case number and the title of the case. Uh, the title is McKimmy versus OpenSea, and it was filed in the District Court in the Southern District of Texas. So this is in federal court right now. And uh, before we go on and, and do an, either, an even deeper analysis of this, uh, I just wanted to let you know that we did another video earlier today where we did a broader overview of the situation regarding how, why this lawsuit was filed, how it was filed, and the events that transpired leading up to this lawsuit. So if you want to see that, that's going to also be linked down in the description below. But this video is going to focus on just doing an analysis of this complaint here, so whenever you... Um, want to start a lawsuit, it begins with filing the complaint. So the plaintiff files the complaint, which then pretty much opens up the lawsuit. So they, within that complaint, they list all of their grievances, they list the parties to the lawsuit, and then what they want the court to do for them, right? In addition to jurisdictional statements and causes of action, so on and so forth. We'll go through all that. But the lawsuit pretty much begins when the complaint is filed in the court, the court receives it, and then the plaintiff serves the defendant. So here we've got a copy of the docket in this case. You know, we went over the, the title, where it's filed, so on and so forth. Um, we can see it's a breach of contract suit, breach of fiduciary duty. Uh, the most recent entries, we could see this case was filed on February 18th of 2022. So that was just a few days ago. And the most recent entry is from earlier today. It was in order for an initial conference, right? So we're going to parse out the lawsuit and begin there and then go through it line by line and do an analysis. All right, so here is a copy of the complaint that we downloaded from that docket entry. And as far as complaints go, this is pretty, you know, concise and to the point. I think it's only one, two, three, four, five. I mean, the, the substance of this thing is only six pages with the seventh being a signature page. So, I mean, this, this plaintiff, I got to commend whoever this guy's attorney is. This is the type of stuff that I like to see. And this was always my approach. Uh, when I was practicing as a prosecutor, I was always less is more. People that are reading these things, judges, clerks, um, they don't want to sit down and spend all day reading every single possible thing that someone can have to say about a particular issue or a particular um, case that's being litigated. They want your best arguments front and center. And it's that old adage, less is more, and I, I believe in that 100%. You know, why say in 100 words what you can say in 10? So, with that said, I'm going to commend this guy, first and foremost, for, for making a nice, concise lawsuit and just boiling everything down together into this nice, uh, neat little package. So, let's start going through it. Okay, here, we can see the caption right here. This is the caption. Um, it lists at the very top. This is the... The jurisdiction we're in, we're in the United States District Court for the Southern District of Texas, the Houston Division, right? So this is coming out of Texas in federal court. Here are the parties to the suit. Very simple. This is the plaintiff. His name is Timothy McKimmy. And the defendant, the defendant is Open C, right? And I'm sure as we go down into the parties, they're going to, yep, here we go. They're going to name them as a corporation, right? A juridical entity, also known as a corporation or a business entity, so on and so forth. Because <laughs> business entities have juridical personhood, too. You can have a natural person, like this guy, Timothy McKimmy, or a juridical person, right? A business entity, so on and so forth, or a trust, or any of those different examples. But that's that's neither here nor there. So we've got the parties to this suit, right? Here is the case number. We know it's a civil action, and he demanded a jury trial. We'll bring back up why this is unique or why it's interesting, considering some of the arbitration implications that are going to come up later on down the line. 
All right, so continuing on, we could see uh, the title of this, this document is Plaintiff's Original Complaint. So, I mean, that's, that's pretty obvious what this is. And it begins, to the honorable judge of this court, comes now Plaintiff Timothy, I guess that, okay, well, that's not good. Timothy McKimmy, <laughs> I don't like that. I don't like typos. You got to read your pleadings. So <laughs> maybe I was a little premature in, in giving this uh, attorney props on his concise uh, <laughs> recollection of, of the issues giving rise to this suit. But we'll go on. Uh, comes now Plaintiff Timothy McKimmy, who files this original complaint against defendant OpenSea, and for cause of action, respectfully shows this court the following. All right, so that's our nice little opening paragraph, right? And so now we hear the part of the complaint uh, that, that pertains to jurisdiction and venue. And in any complaint, in particular in federal court, you have to have a short, concise jurisdictional statement that says why the court that you are filing this in has jurisdiction over this matter, and also why the venue that you choose to file it in is the proper venue based on the, the jurisdictional rules and the facts of this case, right? And as we said before in, in different long-form analysis videos, um, you need proper jurisdiction, proper venue, and the proper parties to a case to have a properly filed lawsuit. And if you're missing any one of those three and they're improper according to the procedural rules of a given court, the court will kick it right back out. The defendant can come, come back and in their response file what's known in my jurisdiction as an exception, or there are different defenses in certain other jurisdictions that say, hey, improper jurisdiction. Oh, hey, improper venue. Oh, no, nope, you got the wrong guy. I'm not the right party. And the court, you know, if the defendant's right, the court will kick it right back out. And it's like, okay, good luck. Try again. So let's see what this guy, the plaintiff, has to say about jurisdiction and venue. First, the court has jurisdiction over the lawsuit pursuant to 28 U.S.C. 1332, which is the jurisdictional rule that this guy, the plaintiff, is citing. And he says, okay, court, you have jurisdiction over this lawsuit because the parties are diverse in citizenship and the amount in controversy exceeds $75,000. All right, well, that's, that's diversity jurisdiction. Generally, there are two types of jurisdiction that you can have when you go to federal court, and it's either diversity jurisdiction or um, federal question. And so a lot of times you can have a complaint or a cause of action that will sound in both federal and state law, right? And then it's just a matter of where the plaintiff chooses to go, whether they want to file in federal court or in state court, and whether or not a federal court has jurisdiction over that particular cause of action, right? And so things that are federal question, like copyright, like bankruptcy, those are certain issues, jurisdictional subject matters, that federal courts will always have jurisdiction over, right? There's a whole list of them. If you want to learn more, you could um, Google the keyword federal question, right? Federal question jurisdiction. And you'll see all the different types of jurisdictional subject matters that a federal court will have um, jurisdiction over, right? The other path to federal court is to have what's known as diverse parties. So parties that are uh, citizens of different states, right? And in addition to having diverse citizenship, parties that are different citizens of different states, you also need a mountain controversy that exceeds $75,000. And that's how you get diverse citizenship. So for example, let's say I lived in California and the person that I wanted to sue also lived in California. And I wanted to sue them in federal court. I'd have a problem there if it wasn't federal question jurisdiction, right? If they just ran their car into me and I wanted to sue them, I'd have to either be from, let's say, Mississippi and then try to sue them when they were based in California, when they were a citizen of California. If I'm a citizen of Mississippi and the defendant was a citizen of California and I had damages that exceeded $75,000, boom, I've got diversity jurisdiction there, right? But if you have, let's say you have an amount in controversy that exceeds $75,000 where both me and the plaintiff, the plaintiff and I, or scratch that, I am the plaintiff and the defendant in question, we both are citizens of California, he runs his car into me, and I have damages that exceed $75,000, and I want to get into federal court, can't do it. Not diverse. Both citizens of the same state, right? So I need another path to try to get there. So that's just a basic kind of overview of jurisdiction in this matter. A little longer-winded than I'd like to have given, but I think, you know, it's, it's, it's a very complex topic. It took me a while to really understand what the heck was going on, especially when I was in law school learning all this for the first time. If you'd like to learn more, 
you know, I've given you all the nice little nuggets that you can use to Google and do your own research on that, but that's just a, a, a nice macro level overview of what's going on with diversity jurisdiction. All right, so continuing on, second, venue is proper in this district because defendant does substantial business in this district through its online platform. This is also the district the plaintiff was in at the time he purchased the NFT. Okay, good. Um, I mean, that, that's, that's pretty to the point. Um, the reason that he put substantial business in here, the plaintiff did, saying that defendant OpenSea does substantial business in the plaintiff's district in Texas is because there are certain uh, procedural precedents in federal court that require, in order for a court to extend jurisdiction and exercise jurisdiction over a party, that party must have substantial contacts to a particular jurisdiction such that exercise of the court's jurisdiction over that party does not offend the traditional notions of fair play and substantial justice. I think that that's the standard. I might be off by a word or two, but that's, that's the general overall standard, right? So he's saying, okay, this is the proper venue. The plaintiff was in this district at the time he used OpenSea, and the defendant has certain minimum contacts with this district. It operates its platform online in this, in this jurisdiction of this district, right? Continues, this is also the district the plaintiff was in at the time he purchased the NFT at issue. Okay, so we've got our minimum contacts there. Parties. Easy peasy right here. Here's the parties. Three. Plaintiff Timothy McKimmy is an individual living in Texas. Okay. Four. Defendant OpenSea is a foreign corporation headquartered in New York. Defendant may be served via certified mail return receipt requested to its headquarters at 105 East 24th Street, number 4D, New York, New York, 10010. And so what they mean by foreign corporation, you know, this defendant, OpenSea, it's a corporation. It's not necessarily foreign in the sense that it's not American. It's foreign in the sense that it is not a citizen of Texas, right? So it is headquartered in New York. Its citizenship is New York. We're going to serve them in New York, right? Okay, continuing on. Here's the factual background. This is where we get into the, the nice, juicy, meaty stuff. All right, five. Defendant OpenSea is the principal non-fungible token, quote-unquote, NFT, marketplace. It is widely referred to as the, quote, eBay of NFTs. Now, as a side note, that's the first time I've ever heard OpenSea referred to as that, the eBay of NFTs. But, I mean, I guess it holds water. I guess you could call them that. Um, okay, continuing on, six. In only four years of existence, defendant has handled over $11 billion in sales to date, including the sale of a Bored Ape Yacht Club NFT for $3 million. The information, italicized right here, reported OpenSea was recently fielding new investment offers that valued the company at $10 billion. Other outlets reported the valuation at close to $13 billion. Okay, continuing on. To use OpenSea, users must connect crypto wallets to OpenSea. Defendant was aware of security vulnerabilities in its platform. Okay, well, that's, that's a pretty uh, conclusory allegation right there. Despite having full knowledge of these security issues, defendant did not properly inform its users and did not timely put adequate safety measures in place. All right. Eight. Instead of shutting down its platform to address and rectify these security issues, defendant continued to operate. Defendant risked the security of its users, NFTs, and digital vaults to continue collecting 2.5% of every transaction uninterrupted. 9. The Bored Ape Yacht Club consists of 10,000 unique NFTs. The current price of entry for the lowest valued Bored Ape is 98 ETH or 307,564 US dollars. Ownership of a Bored Ape NFT gives an individual access to the Yacht Club, which contains numerous member-only benefits. One of those benefits is the ability to converse with other Yacht Club members. Owners of Bored Ape NFTs include current NBA star Steph Curry, LaMelo Ball, NBA Hall of Famer Shaquille O'Neal, soccer star Neymar, Dallas Mavericks owner Mark Cuban, Tennis great Serena Williams, comedian Kevin Hart, music artists such as Justin Bieber, Future, Lil Baby, Post Malone, Steve Aoki, and Eminem, and numerous other individual investors. All right, so number 10. 
Plaintiff is the rightful owner of Board Ape number 3475. On or about February 7th, 2022, Plaintiff's Board Ape was stolen, listed, and sold to another individual on defendant's platform. Plaintiff did not list his Board Ape for sale on the marketplace. Defendant's security vulnerability allowed an outside party to illegally enter through OpenSea's code and access Plaintiff's NFT wallet in order to list and sell Plaintiff's Board Ape at a literal fraction of the value, at 0.01 ETH. Essentially, OpenSea's vulnerabilities allowed others to enter through its code and force the listing of an NFT. This is through no fault of the owner. All right, now, before we continue, I think that this is worthwhile to mention and kind of figure out. You know, right here in uh, paragraph 10, the plaintiff claims that defendant's security vulnerability allowed an outside party to illegally enter through OpenSea's code and access plaintiff's NFT wallet in order to list and sell the board ape at a literal fraction of the value. Essentially, OpenSea's vulnerability allowed others to enter through its code and force the listings for an NFT. Now, doing a deeper dive into what actually happened in terms of the vulnerability or the exploit, uh, we can see here's this decrypt article that, that kind of goes over what the OpenSea exploit was and what happened and how it worked. And, you know, we can see it says in pertinent part, it appears that some holders, like one of the same people that was taken advantage of by this same exploit, did not pay the necessary Ethereum gas fees to delist their items fully, instead choosing to use OpenSea's transfer feature. So they had listed an item, didn't want to pay the gas in order to cancel a listing or delist the item, and instead chose to transfer it, right? So continuing on, it says, if NFT holders transfer their NFTs from a main wallet to a secondary one and back to the main wallet, they can virtually, on the front end at least, delist their item from OpenSea. But this transfer method does not actually appear to cancel previous listings on the blockchain's back end, leaving NFTs vulnerable to the exploit. Using orders.rarable.com provides a solution to concerned NFT holders as it allows users to view all previous and current listings on their NFTs on Rarible or OpenSea. They will have to pay the gas fees to effectively cancel those old listings to eliminate the ability for them to be purchased off the blockchain. So, you know, in some, you know, I think what we have here is this plaintiff and the other people that were rubbed through this exploit were too cheap to pay the gas fees to delist these things, so use this transfer feature to uh, transfer the NFTs in question, right? Thinking that that would effectively delist them, but no, it didn't. It actually kept the listings available on the back end of the blockchain and allowed them to get rug. So this is through no fault of the owner. I think that this is kind of a loaded allegation here, but that's the beauty of the court system. That's where all of these things are gonna get hashed out, right? So continuing on, we go to paragraph 11. It states, after this forced entry through OpenSea code and immediate purchase slash sale, it was then immediately resold at 99 ETH, which is still vastly below value based on the rarity of the board ape. 12, the quote purchase or quote sale of plaintiff's board ape was reported by numerous social media accounts due to its egregiousness. Twitter user at board ape bot reported quote, Board Ape number 3475 was purchased for 0 0.01 wrapped ETH. Okay, 13. Prior to the filing of this lawsuit, plaintiff attempted to resolve the issue numerous times with defendant. Defendant ignored plaintiff. Defendant claimed to be, quote, actively investigating the issue. Yet, as of the filing of this complaint, defendant has failed to reverse the transaction, return the Board Ape, and or provide any adequate remedy. Now, I mean, this is loaded, and I think that this touches on the, maybe not only the plaintiffs, because I know a lot of NFT people aren't necessarily blockchain enthusiasts. You know, they're, they're more about the NFT side of things. But if you really understand the blockchain, you know, same thing with the plaintiff's attorney, you would know that it is virtually impossible to reverse any sort of transaction like that. You know, in order to do that, you would have to effectively fork the entire blockchain and spawn off a new chain similar to what happened with the original Ethereum DAO hack that resulted in two versions of the chain, Ethereum Classic and Ethereum, that which we have now, right? And 
to that, that that's that's the beauty of the blockchain. You know, there's there's no cyber police or central authority that you can appeal to in order to do a take these backsies, right? You know, your things get hacked, you know, DYOR, do your own research and become your own bank and take your own precautions because these things happen. This is the risk that you have for being unbanked, right? So I just want to clear that up on, on number 13, paragraph 13, right? All right, continuing on. Paragraph 14. Plaintiff also attempted to resolve the issue with the individual who currently possesses plaintiff's board ape. The individual refused to return it. Well, I guess at that point, it's not really plaintiff's board ape anymore. It's whoever actually has possession of it and that record on the blockchain. So it's not plaintiff's board ape, but I guess that's just kind of being salty on my part. All right, 15, paragraph 15. Uh, plaintiff's board ape. Here, go again. Not plaintiff's board ape, but okay, continuing on, I'll, st I'll stop myself. Plaintiff's board ape has significant value. This is unquestionable. For example, Justin Bieber purchased board ape number 3001 for 500 ETH or $1.3 million at the time of the transaction. Bieber's board ape has a rarity score wow. has a rarity score of only 53.66 and a rarity rank of 9777. In contrast, plaintiff's board ape has a rarity score of 138.52 and a rarity rank of 1392. It is in the top 14% of rarity, and it is significantly rarer than Bieber's. Thus, plaintiff's board ape's value is arguably in the millions of dollars and growing as each day passes. Well, I feel like even those allegations that we just heard are, you know, somewhat loaded. I mean, that assumes that the, the value in the market for these board apes is going to continue to increase even in a bear market, which we may or may not be in, depending on who you talk to. But I guess that's besides the point. Continue on and continue to paragraph 16. Plaintiff brings this lawsuit to protect the interests of NFT owners who reside in countries worldwide and use defendant's platform. Plaintiff brings this lawsuit to force defendant to enact sufficient security measures and address the known susceptibilities in its interface. 17. NFT forums have discussed instances in which defendant has approached other victims with an NDA and offering the base floor price regardless of the rarity of the specific NFT that was stolen. In this instance, defendant has not approached plaintiff with any solution. So I guess that's just pretty much talking about how uh, OpenSea has been going to other individuals that have been affected by this or similar exploits and offering to settle with them by, I guess, in part getting them to sign an NDA. I'm assuming that as part of um, either the NDA or a settlement agreement, they would have to waive their rights against um, OpenSea for any causes of action that would arise from this, effectively settling and offering them the floor price. You know, as they said here, regardless of the rarity of the NFT. Because I suppose that could be subjective depending on how you approach it or analyze it, right? The price of an NFT based on rarity. Because it's not necessary that all the rarer the NFT, it always means you're going to get a higher value for it. Or I don't think that those two are necessarily always intertwined value and rarity. Although it, it makes logical sense, I don't think it's a, a, a universal rule. I think that's probably why OpenSea is just trying to cheap out and give them the floor price as an offer. All right, but continuing on, paragraph 18. Defendant's platform is no stranger to controversy. On its Twitter account on January 27th, 2022, Defendant revealed over 80% of items created with its minting tool were, quote, plagiarized works, fake collections, and spam. This is in addition to numerous reports of security breaches. In September of 2021, defendant admitted insider trading of NFTs it promoted. Defendant's own executive, who was head of product, used inside knowledge to buy NFTs before they were promoted on its website. And I think that this refers back to that instance where there was an executive at OpenSea that would, um, he knew which projects were going to be promoted on OpenSea's uh, homepage, right? And I think he would do some sort of insider transaction, either, you know, buying or having a stake in some of these projects before that they would get listed on the homepage, which he knew when they were going to get listed. And then he would get an interest in those projects. And then once they were listed and there was a whole bunch of buzz surrounding those projects, I think he would then dump on them or dump on retail users that would um, 
come along and then buy these projects that were listed on the homepage due in large part to the amount of buzz generated by being on the homepage. So yeah, not a good look. And to my knowledge, I think OpenSea actually got rid of this dude and canned him. All right, 19. Defendant's actions were a proximate cause of plaintiff's injuries. Had it not been for defendant's actions and inactions, plaintiff would not have suffered damages. So I think that they're putting there. They're putting that into the uh, factual statement in order to try to get a basis with which to allege negligence. And then, oh, what do we have here in the causes of actions? The first one, negligence, right? Um, in order to allege negligence, you need um, certain conduct or certain actions to be the proximate cause of harm suffered by a plaintiff, right? So, but for the defendant's conduct, I would not have suffered this harm. Therefore, the actions of the defendant were the proximate cause of my injuries, right? That's kind of basic negligence theory, right? So here we have paragraph 20. Under the causes of actions and negligence in particular, it states, plaintiff realleges each aforementioned allegation as if it is fully incorporated below. Okay, pretty self-explanatory. 21, defendant owed, duty, owed a duty of reasonable care to the plaintiff. Defendant breached this duty in several ways, including but not limited to the following. And... As an aside, there are four, in general, four elements to negligence, right? And they are duty, breach, causation, damages. And it starts off duty, so this is why he's starting off with duty. Each and every other person owes a duty of care and, you know, reasonable diligence to everyone else, right? So if you don't owe a duty to someone, then you can't have a negligent interaction with them. So when you're driving, for example, you owe a duty to the other drivers to drive your car in a safe manner that will not harm them. And when you harm someone else by driving your car into them, you arguably breached the duty of care owed to that person that you hit. So then that goes to the second cause of our, the second element for negligence, breach. In order to have negligence, you need to breach the duty that you owe to someone. So when you hit someone in a car, right? You owe them a duty to drive safe. You breached it. You hit them. That's the second element. Boom. Right? Causation. Causation. So you need to cause some sort of harm to them, right? The harm that that individual suffered as a result of you breaching your duty of care owed to them needs to be caused by you. So if I'm driving my car out there and then I hit someone and then they get damaged, right? It's not like, oh, they were damaged because um, a bird ran into them the damages that they suffered were a direct cause of me and my actions. I ran into them. They broke their arm, you know, in their car, right? I caused damage to that person. That's the third element. Damages. As we just said, you need to suffer some sort of compensable damages. Broken arm, busted car, any of that. That could be, um, you know, you could be made whole as a result of suffering those damages, right? So there are the four elements for a negligence analysis. You need all four of those duty, breach, causation, damages in order to have negligence, right? And so at this point, the plaintiff is going to lay that out and pretty much um, apply that to the facts of this case and why the defendant was negligent in interacting with the plaintiff. So we started off, okay, defendant owed a duty of reasonable care to the plaintiff. Defendant breached this duty in several ways, including but not limited to the following. A, failing to exercise reasonable care B, failing to take proper measures to protect users. C, failing to use reasonable security systems and networks. D, failing to institute safety protocols. E, C, D, E, failing to address vulnerabilities it knew or should have known of. F, failing to properly secure. G, failing to properly safeguard. H, failing to implement processes by which they could timely detect, address, and or remediate security breaches. Yeah, um, you know, in my opinion, this wasn't the best or most eloquent uh, negligence analysis, but it is what it is. I think he just kind of threw uh, what he could at the wall and it's going to try to see what sticks. So that's it for the negligence analysis. Going on, uh, we have the second cause of action, breach of fiduciary duty, trust, contract, and implied contract. And it says uh, for paragraph 22, plaintiff realleges each aforementioned allegation as if it is fully incorporated below. 23. Defendant breached its fiduciary duty owed to plaintiff by failing to implement policies and procedures to prevent, identify, detect, respond to, mitigate, contain, and or correct security violations. 24. Defendant failed to protect the integrity of its system and failed to timely notify and or warn 
plaintiff and others to the extent uh, and severity of vulnerabilities in its code and systems. 26, by entering into contracts and or implied contracts with defendant, users expected defendant security practices to comply with laws and regulations. Users, like plaintiff, also expected defendant to reasonably protect wallets which were connected to its platforms. Now, this is loaded. I think the plaintiff, sh if they're going to come out and say, hey, users expected defendant security practices comply with laws and regulations, state the laws, right? You know, don't just give me this conclusory statement without actually stating the laws, you know, that that's kind of bad lawyering there. And then here, this statement about users like plaintiff also expected defendant to reasonably protect wallets which were connected to its platform. As a crypto user, I mean, that that's rule number one. That's your wallet. Those are your keys. That's your responsibility, right? You know, how is it, how is it OpenSea's fault? You didn't sure up your own keys or your own wallet and, you know, you, you were too cheap to pay the gas fees to cancel a listing, and so it stayed listed, and you didn't have the due diligence to actually check to make sure it was still listed, right? So, uh, I've got a bone to pick with that one. All right. Uh, preservation notice, 27. Plaintiff hereby requests and demands that defendant and its agents, attorneys, and insurers preserve and maintain all evidence pertaining to any claim or defense to the incident made on the basis of this lawsuit or the damages resulting therefrom, including but not limited to any internal communications discussing security issues, memoranda, files, emails, text messages, investigation reports, reports of prior hacks, and or any other data or information related to the referenced incident. Failure to maintain such items will constitute a spoilation of the evidence. So they're just pretty much saying, hey, we're putting you on notice. Keep all relevant evidence um, intact. Don't try to delete anything because we're going to come after you for spoilation if you do, right? Here's the jury demand. 28, plaintiff demands a jury trial and hereby tenders the jury fee. Damages. 29, plaintiff seeks damages for the loss of the board ape. Plaintiff seeks any and all damages to which he may be entitled, including the return of the board ape, damages equivalent to the valuation of the board ape, and or monetary damages over $1 million. Plaintiff seeks attorney's fees, costs, expenses, and pre- and post-judgment interest and injunctive relief requiring defendant to pause and or stop any listing or sale of the board ape in question. Right? Well, you know, as we said earlier, you know, good luck stopping the blockchain. You know, while they probably do have control over what happens on their platform, you know, I think that um, whoever has the board ape now could just use a different platform to transfer it, right, or to list it. So good luck on that one. Prayer. Here's the prayer for relief. For these reasons, plaintiff asks that defendant be cited to appear and answer this suit. Plaintiff prays for any and all, any and all other relief to which he may be entitled to. And here is our attorney from the lawsuit, the law firm of Daly and Black, Andrew Dow, right? Hmm. Andrew Dow. So it's him and the Tadgidi Law Group, Ash Tadgidi, right? And they are the attorneys for the plaintiff. All right, so that is the lawsuit. So, or the complaint, rather, that opened up this lawsuit. So with that said... Uh, let's do a little bit of analysis on this. A few uh, points of note. I think uh, first and foremost, it's just the way that um, you know programs and smart contracts work on the blockchain. You know, Ethereum in particular, OpenSea is is nothing more than smart contract, right? You know, as we can see here, you get a summary. OpenSea is the first decentralized peer-to-peer -peer marketplace for blockchain-based assets, so on and so forth. But under the architecture. OpenSea is powered by, powered by the uh, Wyvern Protocol, a set of robust Ethereum smart contracts specifically designed for buying and selling unique digital assets, right? So I, it goes back to the premise that um, code is law, in a sense. And if you're just interacting with this smart contract in a way that it permits you to do, you know, what, what harm is really done by actually operating in accordance with the law of the contract, right? With the program, how it works on the blockchain. So I know that this plaintiff, he's, you know, getting all in a huff over the fact that his board ape got rugged from underneath him. But, you know, he probably, if he would have taken the time and done his own research and the due diligence to actually understand how these contracts worked and the issue that we were talking about earlier with the gas fee uh, required for delisting, you know, this could have been prevented had he taken the necessary steps, right? And so a lot of it goes back to do your own research. And I know we're not all Solidity programmers. We don't know, um, all of us, you know, the extent to which there are vulnerabilities that would not have otherwise been accounted for in these smart contracts. But, I mean, it is something to consider. Now, although I do think that, you know, yes, 
this guy was wrong, right? As to whose fault it was, I think the jury's still out on that. That's why we have the court system. Um, and even, you know, I think it's still, whew, you know, I, I think it's an, it's an open call because, you know, the person that even um, rubbed these NFTs from this guy, I mean, he was still just interacting with the smart contract in a way that it permitted because code is law, right? So it, it, it's interesting. It brings up a, you know, I guess moral, ethical, and technological dilemmas as to how these things need to be approached and handled. So even here, you know, we could see, um, you know, OpenSea, nothing more than a smart contract as we parse it on Etherscan, all the transactions that go in and out, so on and so forth. So that's one point of contention. Next, I think it's also important to consider OpenSea's terms of service, which are going to be linked down in the description below. Um, in particular, these sections, which I've highlighted, the intellectual property rights, where it um, goes over just, I guess, applicable points for intellectual property rights. But even more so than that, indemnification, where you're pretty much um, indemnifying uh, OpenSea for certain violations, right? And saying, okay, hey, uh, I'm going to indemnify them from any and all our alleged claims, damages, awards, judgments, and so on and so forth. I mean, that's a pretty uh, bold and, uh, a paragraph that, or clause, if you will, that bodes in open seas favor. In addition to this one, assumption of risks, where it goes over risks associated with the blockchain, right? And then limitation of liability, where you're not going to hold them liable, open sea, that is, for, uh, damages that arise. And then there's another interesting part about the arbitration rules. And I know I touched on this in the other video, but generally, um, when there's any sort of cause of action, a lot of these large corporations, they include in their terms um, arbitration clauses. And what that does is it forces any cause of action that a plaintiff may have against the defendant out of the hands of the court system into private arbitration, where in the court system, everything would generally be public unless it was under seal. So all the documents, all the dirty laundry, um, any judgments or awards, that would all be in the public's view, right? Arbitration works similar to the court system, except everything is usually private and it's held by, instead of a judge, you have a private um, arbitrator that ends up hearing the case and it operates similar to a regular court system, but private. So you're still going to have discovery, you know, you're still going to have, I guess, um, settlement discussions, uh, maybe even hearings or whatnot, but um, everything's private. And one of the, the benefits for arbitration for these big companies is that uh, arbitration is generally more favorable to these larger corporate entities because when you demand a jury trial and you have a jury trial in a traditional civil court of law, uh, you can get a jury that is generally more favorable to an individual plaintiff, right? They're going to look at this plaintiff and be like, oh, he's like me, you know, he's one of my peers. So they're going to be, the, a jury would tend to favor a plaintiff over a large corporation where it's the exact opposite in arbitration. So that's one of the reasons why a lot of these big companies try to push any claims or causes of action into arbitration, right? And so I think that the defendant is going to have a tough time even keeping this case in federal court and getting past this arbitration clause, right? So... With that said, all things considered, I think that it, it's an interesting case. It's a novel case. I'd like to see how this develops. We're definitely going to keep tabs on this and see where this goes. I think one of two things are going to happen, right? Either OpenSea is going to want to settle with this guy, right? And they're going to reach some sort of an agreement and there's going to be an out-of-court settlement. Or this is going to get kicked down into arbitration. And if it does, we won't really know what happens because it's going to be arbitrated outside of the court system. So nothing's going to be public anymore. And if it settles... We probably won't know the terms of the settlement because more often than not, um, the terms of a settlement outside of court are private. So that's my take on what's going to happen here. Um, certainly this, this individual, McKinley or whatever his name was, he's probably the plaintiff. He's probably not going to be the first one to file a, um, well, he's not going to be the last one to file a lawsuit such as this since there were a few other board ape uh, owners and other NFT owners that were rugged as a result of this exploit. But I'd like to see how a court, if it actually gets down to being um, adjudicated on the merits of the case, I'd like to see how the court handles uh, an issue like this, where you have a smart contract and then individuals were just operating with the smart contract or interacting with it in accordance with the laws and the programming set forth in that smart contract, right? It resulted in these rugs, but, I mean, 
these rugs were permitted as a result of the code of that smart contract, you know, not canceling, paying gas fees to cancel a listing or delisting and trying to use this workaround where you're transferring from one wallet to another and using that and assuming that that actually delisted the item, but it really didn't, you know, when you were too cheap to pay the gas fee. So all in all, interesting stuff. I'm, I'm going to like to see how this is going to work out and handle itself in the long run. We're going to keep tabs on this for you guys and then provide updates as they come down. But once again, if you enjoyed this content, please, please, please hit that like button and subscribe to our channel so we can keep continuing to push out more content. Uh, please also let us know what you think, how you think this is going to play out in the comment section below. Um, also, if you have any suggestions for things that you'd like to cover, please let us know in the comments below. We love interacting with you guys. And with that said, thanks again for watching. As always, we will see you all in the next video.